walking into a classroom at the start of a new semester, my first priority is to always foster community and a sense of connection with my students. To that end, I often ask what they're excited or nervous about for that semester. When I was teaching non-majors general introductory biology, my students often said things like this to me at the start of the semester. Science ugh, makes me nervous. I'm not any good at biology. Science, it's just not interesting. And it wasn't just my students either. Research suggests that non-science majors struggle to engage with biology, see the relevance to their own lives, and have little motivation to engage with science outside of the classroom. And it isn't just university students either. The general public mistrusts scientists, scientific information, and struggles to see how we go from scientific questions to science knowledge. Maybe you're looking at some of these quotes, and you feel the same way. Science makes you nervous. You don't feel like you're any good at it, or it's just not interesting to you. But what if I told you that you engage with biology everywhere, every day? that biology is all around us and more interesting, exciting, and accessible than you may think. Acknowledging biology all around us is important, not only because it enriches our lives, but because confidently engaging with biology is important for the health and welfare of society. Biology is everywhere, and there's a certain danger associated with thinking that it's not. We saw this come to the forefront with the COVID-19 pandemic. Everyone was forced to engage with biology and make biologically minded decisions, some of which were major decisions, like deciding to homeschool children, delaying starting school by a year, or changing business models. We all had to make decisions about mask wearing, what kinds of masks we would wear, what kind of activities we would pursue, how far we would venture outside of the house, if at all. And it isn't just the COVID-19 pandemic either. It's issues ranging from genetic technologies to vaccines to climate change. Biology is in every aspect of our lives. So let's take a look at some of the places where you might see biology as part of your life. Because when we begin to make these connections, it's easier to engage with the bigger issues. I have a three-year-old son. He is the light of my life. And the nice thing about spending time with a three-year-old is that they're not afraid to ask biology questions. One day, we were at the playground, and he handed this to me. It's smooth, it's leathery. If I shake it, it makes a rattling noise. And these were laying all over the ground at the playground. I thought this was a great biology everywhere moment, so we broke it apart, and we found these inside. And I took this picture and I put it on social media and I asked my followers what they thought these were. Their hypotheses ranged from fecal matter, either from a moose or a rabbit, to burn nuts from the Colorado wildfires, to some kind of mummified fruit. The answer is that these are seeds and they're found in a seed pod of a honey locust tree. And if you drive through Colorado in the winter, you can often see these seed pods hanging in the trees. So biology is everywhere, including laying on the ground at the playground. We also see biology in our kitchens, too. Do you like bacon? Do you like your bacon crispy, which is my preference, or soft and chewy, which is the way my husband likes it? Why does bacon change colors and become crispy when it's cooked to perfection? It's because bacon is made of protein, and protein folds in our bodies to do particular jobs. Think of it like making an origami boat. If you have a flat piece of paper and you put it in the water, it doesn't do anything. But fold it into a boat, and it does. It floats. When we heat proteins up, they unfold. And when they unfold, that's when we see these color and texture changes. Incidentally, unfolded protein is also easier to eat. Now, if there's bacteria on our bacon before we cook it, its proteins also unfold when we cook it, and unfolded proteins don't work which kills the bacteria. So that's why cooking our food prevents us from getting food poisoning. So if I asked you, do you like protein biochemistry instead of, do you like bacon? How would your response have been different? When we think about protein biochemistry in the context of our kitchens, it's much more accessible and easier to understand. Okay, so there's biology at the playground and biology in our kitchens. 
How about biology in our own backyards? I have a bird feeder in my backyard, and it's the genesis of several interesting ecological relationships. Ecology is a subdiscipline of biology concerned with the interrelatedness among organisms. Now, there's a lot of bird species in my backyard, and they all visit my feeder. This is a reflection of high bird biodiversity in Colorado, as well as the presence of migration routes along the front range of the Rocky Mountains. Some birds come to my feeder and they dig around, and they make a big mess on the ground. Other birds, like nuthatches, come in and very carefully pick up a single seed and fly away with it. Now, the squirrels, they're also very interested in my bird feeder as well, but they can't reach it. But they can get to those seeds on the ground, and so the squirrels and the birds eat the seeds, and they leave the hulls for me to clean up, which is sweep out into my backyard. And so those hulls in the backyard decompose and release nutrients into the soil, which helps my grass to grow. And if my grass is growing better, there's more habitat for insects. And if there's more habitat for insects, there's more birds coming into my backyard to eat the insects, and so on and so on. Life is all interconnected, and all it takes to see that is to look out the window. Now, biology we can see by looking out the window is all well and good. But what about the biology that we can't see very easily? Or when a working knowledge of biology can help us get through life's tough moments? One night after dinner, I was watching my son play in the backyard. And I turned to my husband and said, it's amazing what you can do with a single cell. My husband gave a sperm cell, and I gave an egg cell, and together we made a new person. And from those original cells, he grew into the happy and energetic tiny human we see today. Having a child is a fascinating experience in biology in so many ways. Everything from the changes my body went through while pregnant to fingers that look surprisingly like my own, but that are on my son's hands. We had an interesting adventure in immunology, blood typing, and genetics when my son was born. Human blood cells have sugars on the surface. So when you hear about somebody having type A blood, that means they have A-type sugars. Someone with B-type blood has B-type sugars, and somebody with A-B blood has both. They have A and B sugars. Now, for people who have type O blood, like me, we don't have sugars on our blood cells. You can think of O like no. No sugars on our blood cells. Now, what happens if you get someone else's blood in your system that doesn't match your blood type? Your immune system recognizes those cells as foreign, attacks, and destroys them. Now, I have type O blood, but my son, he has type A blood. And when I was in labor, our blood mixed together, and my immune system attacked his type A blood. Ultimate result? He was jaundiced when he was born. Jaundice occurs because of excessive bilirubin in our systems, and bilirubin is caused by blood cell breakdown. So he spent much of the first few days of his life sleeping on a billy bed to break down the excessive bilirubin. Now, this was terrifying to my husband and I as first-time parents. But knowledge is power. And my biology everywhere oriented mind started worrying away, trying to figure out what happened, how it happened, and if it could happen again. If I have type O blood, how can I have a son who's type A? Blood typing is an example of a genetic phenomenon called codominance. Codominance means that if you have a gene variant, you express it. So somebody who has AB blood has a gene variant for A and a gene variant for B, and that's how they can be AB. Now, for somebody with type O blood like me, I have two gene variants for O. So my genotype is OO, and so I can only pass an O-type variant onto my son. So. This means the fact that my son had a very adventuresome few days of his life, complete with lots of blood draws, was entirely my husband's fault. <laughs> the only way my son could have type A blood is because he must have gotten an A-type gene variant from my husband. So if we draw up the rest of this potted square and make some predictions, we'll see the chances of my husband and I having another child that's jaundice at birth from ABO incompatibility is at the minimum 50%. So having a biology of our minds that helped us get through a tough first few days with our son. We also find biology in the places we least expect it, like in the band room. As schools consider cutting their arts program in favor of the sciences, it's important to remember two things. First, that biology 
tells us about the powerful experience we have with the arts. And second, that intentional combination of an artistic and biological viewpoint has led to many great discoveries. Why do we like music? Why do we listen to music while we work? Why do we feel like a sense of connection with those we make music with? It comes down to biological processes in our bodies. When you get chills listening to a beautiful piece of music, it's because a chemical called dopamine was released in your brain. That sense of connection we feel with those we make music with, it isn't just an emotional connection, it's a physiological connection as well. And it's thought to have been essential for human evolution. And it's not about science or the arts either. Art has been foundational to biology from the very beginning. The first biologists, the naturalists, they didn't have cameras. They had to be able to quickly and accurately draw what they were seeing, both to document their findings and communicate it to other scientists. In fact, the intentional combination of an artistic and a scientific point of view was foundational to one of the greatest discoveries in neuroscience. Santiago Ramon y Quejal was a Spanish scientist and the father of neuroscience. He came up with a neuron doctrine, or the idea that the functional unit of our brains is an individual cell called a neuron. He came up with a neuron doctrine by repeatedly drawing neural tissue. This is one of his drawings. What is so amazing to me about his work is that you can still find it included in modern neuroscience textbooks as reference material, and also touring the world in art exhibitions for their beauty. Whether it's music or our families, the critters in our backyard, or bacon, we experience biology everywhere, every day. When we see biology all around us, it's more exciting, accessible, and engaging. Why does it matter if people see biology everywhere? or forever leave memories of biology class locked in the backs of their brains, never to be thought of again? There are consequences to not engaging with biology, to thinking that it is something that exists outside of our lives rather than is an integral part of who we are. Biology is everywhere, from the simple things we engage in every day to the complex issues in society. We begin to gain confidence by looking at how biology intersects with our daily lives so that we can then turn an eye to the bigger issues. The COVID-19 pandemic forced us to engage with biology. How the illegal trade of wild animal meat or bushmeat from Africa is a major public health threat and a conservation crisis. To the reintroduction of endangered species back to their native lands, particularly species that are apex predators like the gray wolves, back into lands that are now inhabited by humans. Questions about genetic technology, such as the patentability of genes, a question that raised eyes when posed to the United States Supreme Court in 2012, to what biological research can tell us about the realities of climate change, and why seemingly simple consumer decisions, like deciding to reuse everything from diapers, to straws, to grocery bags, matter as part of an ecological system. Engaging with biology isn't just about knowing these things. It's about the health and welfare of society. When we see biology everywhere, we engage. And when we engage, we realize that we are smart enough to understand that it is interesting. That engaging with biology is about knowing every little thing, but being OK with engaging with it as it intersects with our own lives. Biology is everywhere, and yes, you too can engage with it. You did just now by listening to my talk. So where will you experience biology next?